the United Nations estimates that between 800,000 and 4 million men, women, and children are sold into slavery around the world each year. Victims of human trafficking include children involved in the sex trade, adults 18 or over who are coerced or deceived into commercial sex acts, and anyone forced into different forms of labor or services. Forced labor consists of only 20% of human trafficking cases, while the remaining 80% involves sexual slavery. Human trafficking has been widely seen as an issue overseas in Europe and Asia, involving just young teenage girls. But what if I told you that anyone is at risk of being a victim, even men, and that this is not just an issue overseas, but is happening right here in our backyards in America. Human trafficking is also seen as just an issue in large cities. However, as we will discover, this is not always the case. Human trafficking is a threat to every city and every small town in every county in every state in America. To get an understanding of what human trafficking is, we first hear the story of a former victim who thankfully has been rescued from her past. At seven years old, my family moved away from where I was born and where I grew up, and my mom moved with me and my siblings, and we came to a new home, and every summer she would send me back um, to where I grew up in order to visit with family members and um, my dad and his side of the family. And it was during that time that an uncle had come in, into my room while I was visiting my family and had molested me and raped me. And then he's, he, on a regular basis, would, uh, would bring me into a room and have me um, post for pictures and, and do things that I was really uncomfortable with. Um, he started posting those pictures and, and he started um, bringing me into chat rooms uh, he would speak for me and uh, he would tell people what they wanted to hear and, um, and find men um, who were looking for a sexual experience. Um, he would cater whatever it, it was that they wanted uh, to them and would ask me to, or make me work those things through and work those things out. Um, and that's how it started for me. After what he did, he, he threatened me to not um, tell anybody about it. He said that if I did tell anybody that he would make things worse for me. Um, he threatened that it would ruin my family, and he threatened that, um, that he would ruin my life and that he would hurt me. And so um, because of fear, I, d I didn't say anything to anybody. Um, when I went home that year after that summer, um, I didn't want to go back the next time to visit, but my mom didn't understand why I didn't want to go back. Um, I was afraid to tell her, so she sent me anyways, just thinking that um, it would be good for me. When I would go back every year, my uncle would continue to um, take me into these chat rooms to find people who were looking for sexual experiences um, and to deliver those sexual experiences to them. Um, he was also training my younger cousin who was actually the same, close to the same age as me, who was a few months younger. And from the time that he was a very little boy, um, he was forced to watch pornography, por forced to participate in pornography, and um, to, bring up, to bring other girls into that situation. And so he started having us act out situations together that he felt, um, was what other people wanted to see and what other people wanted to experience. Being traded for things and for money 
Um, it made me feel like an object rather than a person. If I, there was ever a time where I thought that this shouldn't be happening to me or I started to question um, that it was okay or that it was normal or that that anyone would um, would help me, then I, I was always reminded by my cousin and by my uncle that um, that things would be worse for me if I was somewhere else, that someone else could have um, control over me rather than them and that they wouldn't be family, that they would um, be harsher with me, that they would not take care of me. And so fear kept me from saying anything and kept me feeling like it was the best thing that I could do just to stay with them. I knew that there was always the possibility of me being sold to someone else and that I would never see my family again. And um, that kept me in bondage to them and to, to what I was doing. Eventually, Child Protective Services demanded that I be put in a place where I had somewhere to go in order to get inpatient treatment. And it was during that time that I opened up about the abuse that I had gone through. From the time that I talked about what had happened in treatment, I was protected from my past and protected from the people who had once abused me. And that time that I came back when I was 16 was the last time that I had ever visited my family and that I had ever been put in that situation. When I tried to confide in um, my parents, when I tried to confide in family members, um, they didn't believe me or they would tell me that I was exaggerating what was happening or um, that it was normal and I didn't know how to respond to that. If I, I knew that if my family wouldn't listen to me or my family who was supposed to protect me wouldn't do anything to protect me, then I didn't know who I could trust or who I could tell. It took me years to start trusting people again. There's something that's called a trauma bond that happens sometimes when people are put in abusive situations for a long period of time and um, oftentimes even though the things that are happening to them are uncomfortable or wrong or abusive they become used to those things and they don't know how to live without those things and there were times in the healing process where I felt that um, I didn't know how to live without my life being like that every day. There were times where uh, I felt drawn to go back to the situation that I was in, even though it was horrible and even though I hated it, because I, because I didn't know how to live any other way. And, it, and this attachment with an abuser is really difficult, I think, for the general public to understand, because it doesn't make sense why someone who has been so abused by someone would desire to go back to them or continue to live in that situation. But it's sometimes when you know what to expect every day, then that feels like the safest thing rather than not knowing what's going to happen. I've had amazing counselors and mentors who have helped me to work through the healing process. It's been really long and it's taken, it's taken a really long time for me to, to develop a trust with somebody enough to share with them about my experiences. To know that God has re released me from my past makes it incredibly freeing for me. There's a scripture that, um, in, there's a scripture in the Bible that says in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation that all old things have passed away and that all things have become new. I know that if I have a new life in Christ, that I don't have to be fearful, but that I can live a satisfying life. Even with everything that has happened to me, I'm able to not live in that every day and to know that, um, that I am a new person. I feel like what I've gone through allows me to open the eyes of people who don't understand what's going on in the world or can't or wouldn't realize that these kinds of things are taking place. My relationship with my husband also helps me to know what real love and respect is, to know what a real relationship is. The first time that I 
was introduced to this was actually through my spouse um, and through her story. And it was difficult. Um, I, my first thought and my first reaction to this was of being very angry. I, I wasn't angry with her in any way, but I was just angry with the situation and how um, something like this could happen, how degrading of a thing that it is and how um, life-sucking it is that a person would have to go through something like this. I don't look at her any differently or any less um, of a person or, or anything in that manner. The sense of accomplishment that you will have, the sense of um, belonging and companionship and relationship that comes with a loving relationship with your spouse is so much more um, than what it would be with, with someone um, that you paid. And if you think that human trafficking is wrong, don't forget about the pornography on the websites. Don't forget about the pornography that you can see on the internet and that you can get in magazines and that you can just see. We oftentimes don't know if these women or men are, are drug into this or if they've willingly chose to do these things. Know that the hope of Jesus Christ is how our marriage can work through this. Know that through any person who has struggled with uh, pornography or any person who has been victimized by human trafficking, know that Jesus Christ is the only way to bring fulfillment and peace and understanding in who they are. To get insight about the type of threat that human trafficking is to the United States and specifically Indiana, we talked to Abigail Kuzma, the Director of Consumer Protection at the Attorney General's Office. Indiana has had a task force since 2005. It's called IPATH, uh, Indiana Protection for Abused and Trafficked Humans. And it is a Department of Justice generated task force. Uh, they came to us in uh, 2004 to let us know that Indianapolis is an area that they had identified as being at risk for human trafficking. Um, there are 40, I think 43 task forces now across the country. Uh, and, and we've been operational since then very active. We've divided up into committees so that uh, we can work together very specifically but also to coordinate on a big picture. So we have a law enforcement task force where the law enforcement members get together and that would include uh, the Attorney General's office, the uh, U.S. Attorney's office, and they are the two co-chairs of the task force. Then we have local prosecutors, local police, FBI, Homeland Security, and others on that law enforcement task force. There's also an outreach awareness task force that was particularly uh, active last year as we were preparing for Super Bowl. And in that capacity, that, that uh, committee as well as the training committee trained some 4,000 people so that we would have an awareness among persons who were likely to encounter a victim. Those were our target audience. Um, as to how to identify a victim and uh, what to do if you think you've identified a victim. So that was a, a very effective part of our work last year. And um, since that time, we've, as you might imagine, been receiving a lot more uh, cases, human trafficking cases. Uh, according to our law enforcement, it's about one a week. So we're not talking about just tips, but actual cases because uh, so many more people who are likely to encounter a victim are looking for the signs and understand what to do if they, if they have encountered a victim. 20 years ago, we used to tolerate domestic violence. Um, thankfully, our society made a shift and now it is not okay to be uh, a perpetrator of domestic violence. Uh, it's totally uncool, it's not tolerated. That's the, the attitude we must have about commercial sex or we're not going to make a dent in human trafficking. These girls are absolutely being exploited. And when you're talking about someone being pulled into this lifestyle at the age of 12 to 14 on average, meaning that a lot are younger, uh, you've got a situation that just has to be stopped and society needs to take hold of this issue.
We also have a victim services committee and that involves all the groups that are actually directly serv servicing the victims. So that might be uh, shelters like for example Julian Center is a domestic violence shelter that serves trafficking victims. The Julian Center is approaching its 40th year uh, serving victims of domestic violence. We are well known in Marion County as the largest shelter uh, for dom domestic violence victims. Uh, we also provide a number of other services, counseling, um, transitional housing, um, and we just try to meet the needs of the domestic violence clients through a lot of different programs. Um, the human trafficking program began in 2006 after a year of exploration and research. Uh, I think there are a number of intersections between domestic violence and human trafficking. Trafficking victims um, have a number of risk factors, uh, really anything that would make them vulnerable. So a lot of times it can be related to poverty, uh, it can be related uh, domestically to you know having a difficult home life, or uh, looking internationally it can be related to uh, war and conflict in the home country or conditions that make it unsafe. And we've had the full range of different types of victims. There's been men and women. We've had labor trafficking issues and sex trafficking issues. We've had both foreign born victims as well as domestic victims and adults and children as well. So we've had minors as well as adults. It's a very big threat to Indiana, and uh, since the Super Bowl, as I mentioned, we've been seeing about a case a week, so it's, it's a very significant matter. Uh, law enforcement is working very hard, but funding for human trafficking is, is slight, and so, uh, and in fact, right now, um, uh, law enforcement is going to be struggling uh, to find funding for this, uh, this type of investigation. It's very, very costly and time-consuming to do human trafficking investigations. We think that there are some uh, 300 children that are vulnerable in the United States to being trafficked um, and about 100,000 that have certainly been trafficked. So it's, it's a very serious matter. Just in the last year and a half, the Indianapolis office of the FBI um, has initiated five new investigations. Um, so this is definitely happening in Indiana, um, both foreign-born victims being brought to Indiana um, to do labor or for being in the sex trade. To see how human trafficking affects cities in Indiana, we go to the greater Lafayette area which has a population of well over 100,000 people. Detective Joe Clyde tells us about how human trafficking affects the greater Lafayette area. We have seen signs of human trafficking in Lafayette. Like I said, the, the, the number one reason we would come across someone who's been trafficked is coming across someone underage uh, and has been prostituted. Um, by definition, that is not prostitution where they are, if they are being forced into it, that is not prostitution. Um, if they're being forced, they're a victim in that case, and they are a victim of human trafficking by the federal statute. Um, that is the majority, I would say, of the cases we've seen in Lafayette where we've had suspected incidents of human trafficking. Human trafficking is something for the community of uh, Lafayette or the greater Lafayette area to worry about. Um, it does affect our community. I don't think um, we have numerous incidents of people being trafficked, but it does occur. And Lafayette, it's not one of those extremely large cities in the United States, yet it's not a small city either. I think during a work day when um, the population has increased because of all the people who drive to our area to work. Um, a typical day, there's somewhere around a quarter million people. Uh, we have a major interstate that runs through Lafayette. We have several railroads. We have all kinds of transportation that converge in Lafayette and go through Lafayette. I can't comment on specific cases, but we've seen uh, girls from Las Vegas come here from Chicago um, and be prostituted. And, uh, you know, keep in mind, once they don't want to be prostituted, even if they've been doing it willingly for years, once they don't want to prostitute themselves, it actually becomes human trafficking. Or as if 
the girl being prostituted is under the age of 18, it's automatically human trafficking. Most incidents go unreported, or they may go years before they are reported. Um, I don't see, you know, the w incidents I've come across, it's almost been like an accident that you run into a case where someone's getting human trafficked because it's very rare that you just get a case where someone's just reporting someone they think's a victim of human trafficking. Investigating and prosecuting human trafficking cases is extremely difficult. It's not impossible, but it's probably one of the most difficult cases to uh, sell to a jury. And it all comes back to educating the general public about, you know, what human trafficking is. Autumn Leibengood is a filmmaker out of Lafayette, Indiana, who is in the process of releasing From Ashes, a film that was inspired by true events of human trafficking. You know, everybody's wondering how human trafficking works. Like, how can they force anybody to do anything? And really, you know, when you're at a vulnerable place in your life and um, these kids are running away from an abusive home life or something, you become susceptible to anybody that will show you love. And um, a lot of times the girls, they, they get brought into it because a man promises them something. And um, whether it be food, a home, shelter, love, anything, and she becomes very susceptible to it. You know, we all want to believe of ourselves that, hey, if I would have been in the Civil War, I would have stood up for the slaves. I would have fought for them. I would have hit them. I would have, you know, moved them on. And, you know, the reality is that if we are not doing something now, right now, in the, with this problem, we wouldn't be doing anything then. We would have remained silent, and that to me makes this modern day slavery. Now we know they're slaves, and what are you gonna do about it? What are you gonna do? How are you gonna step forward? Men can certainly be victims of human trafficking as well. Um, first of all, I think a lot of people associate human trafficking with sex trafficking, which is one part of trafficking, and we automatically assume that that means most victims are women or girls, um, but men and boys can get involved in sex trafficking. In fact, um, the age of entry of boys into prostitution is younger than that for girls. So the average age of entry into prostitution for girls is 12 to 14 years old, and for boys it's 11 to 13 years old. Sex trafficking can happen particularly to young men. It's not as common, obviously, as uh, uh, trafficking for women, but it, it can happen. And in fact, uh, there have been a number of newspaper reports of young men who were very vulnerable, usually homeless, uh, or runaways who were lured into a situation by a pimp and were forced to be uh, prostitutes. So it absolutely happens to, to boys, girls, men, and women. To say that it doesn't happen to boys is to me one of the biggest lies out there. Um, it's like saying that they don't matter and they do matter. The more vulnerable a person is, the more likely it is that they are at risk and likely to become a human trafficking victim. So let's use some examples here. Uh, age is perhaps the most significant vulnerability factor. Uh, we have a lot of underage individuals who are being manipulated into human trafficking. That could be labor trafficking or sex trafficking. And in the sex trafficking arena, people are surprised to find that 83% of all underage sex trafficking victims in the United States are U.S. citizens. Most people know that human trafficking happens in Thailand, it happens in India, it happens right here in our backyard, and most of the victims who are underage sex trafficking victims are U.S. citizens. Signs of a human trafficking victim may include physical abuse, bruises, burns, broken teeth, psychological problems, depression, fear, undernourished, they may be in constant supervision of another person, or 
someone else may have control of all of their forms of identification. They may have a lack of knowledge of where they are, and someone might be a victim if you constantly see them in the same location. One of the most important statistics to know about underage sex trafficking in the United States is that uh, 12 to 14 is the average age kids are pulled into sex trafficking. Um, I mean, that, that is a horrific statistic. Everyone needs to understand that that's the fact. And, uh, and that helps us to understand that, that commercial sex is a very serious part of the problem here. We've got, we've got to work on anti-demand if we're gonna do anything to resolve human trafficking. It is a $32 billion industry each year. That's more than Google, Nike, and Starbucks combined. That, to me, is a shocking number. I mean, 30, think about it, $32 billion spent on these people. That is shocking. It is appalling. What are we saying as a society? And as long as there is demand for this product, there will be supply, because these kids are very vulnerable, and they're getting pulled into this lifestyle at such a young age. It's, uh, as I mentioned earlier, 83% of all underage sex trafficking victims in the United States are U.S. citizens. So it's, it's not something that only happens to foreign-born persons. It happens to, to persons here in the U.S. Who, who should be protected, not only by our families, but by our laws. Human trafficking is ranked as the second largest criminal industry um, after the drug trade. Um, it kind of changes places between human trafficking and the arms trade uh, for second place, but it is a $32 billion industry annually. So there's a lot of money to be made um, and there's a lot of work to be done to end it. Um, it's estimated that 27 million people um, are victims of human trafficking. Um, that's on a global scale. And again, I've seen a range of estimates that go anywhere from 2 million to 27 million. So it's a big range because it's something that happens under the radar most of the time. Between 14,000 and 17,000 people are trafficked into the United States from other countries every year. And within the United States, um, when you look at domestic minor sex trafficking, the statistics are higher. It's between 100,000 to 293,000 uh, children are affected by uh, the sex trade. The average rate to buy a person on the streets is $90. That's, like, that's insane. I mean, what the traffickers are finding out is that if you sell drugs, you sell it once. But if you buy a person, then you can sell that person over and over and over again. And then it's cheap enough to replace them in the end. 39% of the homeless population consists of children under the age of 18. 2,200 kids run away from home each year in the United States. One out of every three of these teens are going to be lured or forced into prostitution within 48 hours of leaving home. Human trafficking is a problem not only of big cities, but also of small towns and rural areas. We've seen in Indiana, for example, human trafficking all across the state. Uh, and and it, we, we need to think about, again, the vulnerability factors, sometimes in a rural area. Uh, you have the kind of isolation that makes it a little easier for something like this to happen. I was not kidnapped or trafficked in, into the city. I was trafficked in rural areas. I went to rodeos where lots of people were gathered and I was brought to small towns where there were big celebrations. Anywhere where large groups of people gather are usually places where there's a demand for sex. Because big cities have higher populations, it's known that there are more instances of sex trafficking there because there are more people. That doesn't mean that it does not exist in small cities or small towns. Trafficking can be found in both big cities and smaller towns and rural areas. Um, there's been um, a high incidence of trafficking at truck stops, for example. So any area that's close to a highway where there's an exit 
um, could be an area where trafficking is happening. Government has done a lot, a lot more needs to be done. Um, both Indiana and uh, the federal government have good laws on human trafficking. The TVPA is the federal law and uh, Indiana has a law as well. The Trafficking Victims Protection Act, it um, provided a definition for what trafficking was and it actually created the crime of human trafficking within the United States borders. Um, and it also set aside funding for prevention and protection and prosecution. So those are the three main arms um, of that. The Indiana State Legislature updated uh, Indiana's anti-trafficking law uh, right around the time of the Super Bowl, and that was to make it easier to prosecute uh, in cases of domestic minor sex trafficking. Whenever you have a large sporting event, you have a higher risk of, of human trafficking uh, just because there is an increased demand for commercial sex and that brings in, unfortunately, uh, the, the, the pimps who want to sell the young girls. On September 25th of 2012, President Obama gave a speech recognizing the problem of human trafficking in the United States. He stated a plan to have the problem newly assessed for the scope and scale of the problem as it occurs in the United States. He proposed that he would strengthen training for security officers and for investigators and for public defenders, that he would train them to treat victims as victims and not as criminals. He stated that he had a plan to work on creating safe places for these victims to go to receive healing and in order to understand how to become a productive member of society. Unfortunately, there are not very many places that actually exist at this point in time. One of the most important things that uh, normal citizens like us can do to combat human trafficking is to talk about it and make sure that uh, our communities are aware of the dangers, aware of what it is and what to do if we think we've seen a, a victim. But maybe even more important is to, again, examine this need for anti-demand, to examine the need to understand that it's commercial sex and, and the drive for commercial sex that fuels human trafficking. So it is absolutely something we need to battle with. It is not uh, a victimless crime and we all need to be aware of all the statistics along those lines. To find out more about IPATH and their efforts against trafficking, you can visit them online at indianaagainsttrafficking.org. You can also find out what you can do to help combat trafficking. As we have seen, human trafficking is one of the most heinous crimes that threatens our world today. We have learned that trafficking is not only a threat to foreign countries and large cities, but is happening in our backyards in the United States and even in small towns. The only way that trafficking can be stopped is through an aware public that will not tolerate this kind of activity in their area. If only we will join as a community and a nation and stand up to these traffickers, then we will start to see change. But the question remains, will we stand up?